Once upon a time, not so long ago, a good friend of mine began to come out as transgender. They were hesitant to reveal this part of themselves because they had seen so many other trans people treated as though they were monsters, less than human, through news reports, social media posts, and comments made by their family and friends. They came out to a group of us who worked together encouraging high school students to counter all forms of oppression. Thankfully, no one in our group treated them as a monster. However, we soon ran into other problems. One member of the group directly refused to refer to them using the pronouns this person said they identified with. The reason? Well, I've always known you using other pronouns. I can't change now. But the director of this group presented another problem. While the director took pride in having someone transgender on staff to discuss issues of oppression, he refused to make space for transgender people in activities about gender, the logical place for people who are transgender to bring up their gender. <sighs> and since there was no space for trans people in the room when we were talking about gender, this friend who identified neither as male nor female was required to sit outside of the room with no explanation to the people we were serving as to why they had to leave. Trans people were kept invisible. I bring this up to you today because this coming Tuesday is National Coming Out Day, an event which began in 1988 connected to the 1987 March on Washington for gay and lesbian rights. The point of the day was to encourage people to come out if they were comfortable as gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender because many people thought they didn't know any LGBTQ people and therefore believed all the stereotypes they held about them. The founders of National Coming Out Day, Robert Eichberg and Jean O'Leary, thought that if people realized they knew an LGBTQ person, the negative assumptions of these groups would be challenged by the sudden visibility of those who were part of these groups. If people were visible, they wouldn't be treated like monsters. The song the choir sang earlier somewhere, uh, it was written by Leonard Bernstein, who is bisexual, and Stephen Sondheim, who was gay, and I've, I've always hoped that secretly it was written as a dedication to the possibility of a visible, safe world for those who are LGBTQ. That's always been my hope and dream. I've never found proof, <laughs> but I've always, I've always hoped. <laughs> now, I want to affirm, in so many ways, UUs have been present in the fight for gay and lesbian rights. The UUA has been affirming of the rights of lesbian, gays, lesbians, gays, and bisexuals since the 1970s. They and we began publicly affirming same-sex marriage and openly affirmed the inherent worth and dignity of lesbians and gay people in the mid-80s. In the 2000s, we started making official statements about transgender inclusiveness. And there are earlier inclusive statements found in our wel welcoming congregations curriculum. In recent years, UUs have done fantastic work for marriage equality, allowing those who want to be married in same-sex relationships to do so. It was amazing work and both a legal and symbolic win for those in our movement who are in relationships. And it is especially important that we as UUs do this work as religious people for two reasons. We are called to see the inherent worth and dignity in people. It's part of why we're here. It's part of the work we do and why social justice is so important to so many UUs. But second, there is an important statement that is to be made by us speaking as religious people on this issue. Because so often religion is invoked as the reason to condemn LGBTQ people. By taking a stand in the name of religion, whether or not you believe in God doesn't matter. It's taking a stand in the name of religion. You help reclaim space that allows LGBTQ people to be seen as deserving of love. So for National Coming Out Day in 2016 in a UU church, what is there to do? <laughs> well, 
First, I'm going to ask us to keep an eye out for four ways we might be treating people as the invisibles, the monsters, the exotic, and the whole. So first of all, the invisibles. Fighting invisibility was one of the main purposes of Coming Out Day, to show that sexual orientation and gender identity is part of the full picture of a person. And there have been many great strides in visibility for gays and lesbians. However, society still struggles with the visibility of bisexual people, for instance. I have literally heard people, both straight and gay, tell me that bisexuals do not exist even when they meet somebody who is bisexual. I mean, it's hard for me to imagine what it would be like for someone to tell me that a part of me just doesn't exist. While I've never been bi, it seems reasonable that if we can have attraction to more than one person in our entire lives, that for some people, that attraction to could be to people of different genders. Oftentimes, people who are transgender, like my friend at the beginning of the sermon, end up invisible because they are afraid of the consequences of being visible. They are afraid that they will be known as monsters. Monsters, someone impure, evil, or wrong by societal standards. These ideas are still commonly placed upon those who identify as transgender, and historically these views have been placed upon LGBTQ people as a whole. In many areas of the United States and world, they still are. Currently, trans people particularly suffer from this treatment, as at least 20 people who are trans in the United States have been victims of violent interactions this year, fatal violent interactions, including Jazz Alford just this week. And it's estimated that 30% of trans youth attempt suicide. UU churches do not agree with a negative perception of anyone who is LGBT and or Q. But this doesn't mean that those outside the walls of this church may not hold that viewpoint. And that view and the expression of it still impacts the lives of beloved community members within UU walls. From hate crimes such as the massacre in Orlando earlier this year, to the heightened rates of suicide for all LGBTQ teens, to even the local hate crimes that Leslie described earlier. We can still see the effects on people of monstering who may be members of our churches. Next, the exotic. While I hope, and I generally believe, that you use don't treat anyone LGBTQ as monsters, I think we might be more prone to find people to be exotic. When we monster someone, we only see their identity, and that identity is a negative, a problem, something horrific. When we find them to be exotic, we see their identity as a good thing. It's just that we only see them as an, as an identity and not as a complete, complex person. Oh, he's gay. He will only throw the most fashionable parties. I definitely want to go to his parties. <laughs> oh, she's a lesbian. She can clearly fix my car. <laughs> we see people as objects, not as full people. And finally, there are whole people. Whole people are made up of a variety of traits and identities. All of these factors mix together to create a person who is complex, multifaceted, and unique. We may know and affirm that they hold one or more specific identities, and we also see those identities as part of a big puzzle that makes them the whole person that they are. The whole person approach is clearly what we're going for here. <laughs> because truly, that is what each one of us are full of layers and complex richness, not defined only by one word. Renoir's poem, Renoir, the acting assistant minister, um, and she, she gave a poem in worship a couple of weeks ago, and it's a perfect illustration of this. And if you weren't here to hear it, I recommend you check it out on our YouTube channel. She reminds us that sometimes we try and fit others into one identity checkbox, like on a census form. But in reality, we are much more than can fit into any one box. We should give people space to fully be who they are. But it's also important that people have space to have specific identities, to say, this is me, I'm bi, or lesbian, or trans, or gay, or queer. It's important because it's a reality of who they are. 
It's a reality of one piece of their fully embodied, beautiful selves. And it is important for us as spiritual people to affirm those identities. Because as spiritual people, when we affirm someone's identity, we make a statement about what, I what identities can be part of a whole and worthy person. So what happens if we as liberal religious people make the claim that LGBTQ identities can be part of that whole person? Latin American queer theologian Mario Ribas proposes an idea from a Catholic perspective. He asks, what if Mary and Jesus are seen outside of their typical identities? What if Mary is seen as having wrinkles around her eyes? What if she is seen as a woman who can actually have sex? And that's okay. What if Jesus is seen as a poor man? What if Jesus is seen as HIV positive? In all these cases, space is made for people who can be seen as whole, as real, and as deserving of love. If we do this in the public square for LGBTQ rights, and as religious people, it becomes a charged statement, flying in the face of conservative condemnation. In Unitarian Universalism, we may not have universally agreed icons, such as Mary and Jesus, but I would say that when we make proactive statements about who we include, and we make those statements loudly, we show people that there is a loving space for them. We show them that we want them present. We show them that we will not force them to be invisible. This also requires the important follow-through work of seeing people as whole people with many identities and many traits when they show up at the door. Not expecting them to fill a certain expectation or checkbox, but simply letting them be a person and find out how they connect to community. This sounds like easy work. Just let people identify as they do and understand people are complex. It sounds easy, but in all honesty, it's not only conservatives who have made mistakes in this area. UUs have tripped up on this too. For instance, looking back at surveys on UU opinions of lesbian, gay, and bisexual people in the 80s, there are loving, affirming responses to questions, and there are some pretty horrible responses, including saying how morally corrupt they are and mentioning that they were going to hell. This is the 80s. It wasn't everybody making this statement, but they were out there. And it took our General Assembly until 2007 to make an official statement about the worth of transgender people. 2007. We have not been perfect. We've definitely improved. And we definitely try and live our values. What has it taken? What will it continue to take to continue to grow and improve? And I say it will take the hardest and most blessed work that there is to do. The hard, blessed work is being in relationship and I mean really caring about someone, and being wrong. The hardest and most blessed work is being in relationship with real people who are complex, and those relationships are complex. It's being in relationship with real people, being wrong sometimes, and doing the work to maintain that relationship. Because let's be real, we're all going to stick our feet in our mouths. I know I have, it's why I wear skinny shoes. <sighs> I've messed up the pronouns of some of my best friends who are trans, and in those moments, I've had to ask myself, what's more important? Being right and looking like a good person by trying to make excuses about why I did it, or apologizing and checking in to see how to move forward in respect and love. When people we care about are hurt, even by our own actions, how do we really listen to that hurt and see it as real? Can we let them make their pain visible without rejecting it as something they're making up or imagining? And complex identities and our complex relationships go beyond just sexual orientation and gender into areas such as race, religious belief, and economic status. This sermon with this idea of the way we see people could easily talk about the ways, for example, we invisibilize the homeless and their needs how society often portrays Muslims as monsters, 
how we objectify and exoticize people who are black, for instance, by touching their hair because it is so different. There are so many examples that our world has presented us with both in the larger world and within the walls of this church. So many opportunities to be more fully present, to improve, to live our values more fully. The real question becomes, do we really want to build that someplace, somewhere, where people can finally, truly see each other? I believe that we want a new way of living. And it will take more than words. It only comes with our commitment to love deeply enough to do the work, stay in complex relationship, to be wrong sometimes, to apologize, and to work for a world where every person is always, only, and completely whole. Blessed be.